Good morning, City Bible Church at home. So good to be with you today. Thank you for being with us. We are in a series that I call Wall-to-Wall Worship. Last week, we looked in the first message of the series at Houses of the Holy. Today, we're going to pick it up from where we left off last time, and we're going to look at Houses of the Holy Part 2 as we see the practical application that comes out of our worship, the practical application that we learned out of the things we looked at last week. Now, before we do, let me just enter into his presence in prayer. And again, Father, we, we come to you with, with hearts that are eager, eager to hear what your spirit would say. Lord, I pray that your word would fall down like rain. I pray, Father, for my heart, that you would cleanse me and create in me a clean heart. As David prayed, see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, the desire of our heart today is to give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, we're going to be looking at 1 Chronicles chapter 16 today. And uh, before we begin, let me just tell you a story. Now, you may not understand this. You may wonder, what? But the very first few years of our marriage was a, a real learning curve for Chris and I. You know, it, it took me a couple of times moving to understand that it didn't matter where I put the furniture when I took it off the truck, as soon as I went to work the next day, it was designed to be rearranged. Sweetie didn't say a word. She just waited for me to be out of the way so she could do what she does best, and that's to nest. Men hunt, women nest. I hung all the pictures, and, and then she would just proceed to quietly move them where they needed to be. Besides, I usually hung them about two feet higher than they should have been. But I learned very early, and I learned very quickly that in our relationship, I could be either right or I could be happy. And I'm happy, happy, happy. I learned the secret. Well, you see, what we had up until that time was a communication breakdown. And the reason is that we are just wired different, differently. We're, we're different. I am task-driven to the point where I have to get everything done. I cannot leave anything undone, and I just have to get it done and out of the way where Chris can multitask. She can, you know, I have a book in my library that's that's called Men Are Like Waffles, Women Are Like Spaghetti. And Chris is like that. She can multitask. She can do 25 different things at once. I have a hard time walking and chewing gum at the same time. But it's not that one is better than the other. It's just that we are different. We are different. So now take that same thing, and if you can imagine, you know, the type of relationship that goes on in a church, exponentially in a church, pretty soon you get the idea that sometimes there might be a communication breakdown in churches. You, you can see why there can be communication problems in the church, and it's not that any of us are better than the other, or that one style of worship, because that's what we're talking about here, it's not that one style of worship is better than the other, it's just that we are diverse. And so with that in mind, I would ask that you take your Bibles and join me in First Chronicles chapter 16, as we look at the second part of this message, Houses of the Holy. And again, this is the practical application from what we looked at last week. Why is it, folks, why is it if we are all blood-bought, born-again believers in Jesus Christ, why is it that we so often seem like so many married couples who just don't seem to be speaking 
on the same level, who aren't always on the same page. You know, sometimes churches split over the most inane things you could ever imagine. When Chris and I lived in North Carolina, I remember hearing about a church that split, now listen to me, over potato salad. I'm serious. It was like an episode on the Andy Griffith show. It was just crazy. I have seen fights develop out of nothing, and so have you, I'm sure. But if we are family, and we are, we are brothers and sisters in Christ, why is it, if we are family, do we have communication breakdown? Well, in a moment, we're going to look at this from First Chronicles chapter 16. And I'm going to show you eight principles of worship. It's a very simple outline that we could see in any of the worship services we see in Scripture. Last week, we looked at one in First Chronicles chapter 6. We looked at one in Second Chronicles chapter 6. And we looked at one in Exodus chapter 40. But we can take those same passages and look and see the same principles that we're going to show today. But first of all, I want us to look at at least two reasons why we don't do it right. We don't always get it right, especially when it comes to the issue of worship. And the first one is this. We don't get it right when we mistake prescription for description and description for prescription. Now, there is a very simple biblical hermeneutic here. And, and remember, hermeneutics is the interpretation of Scripture. Homiletics is the presentation of Scripture. So hermeneutics is what we do when we're studying. Homiletics is what we're doing when we're preaching. Now, as we approach this study, this 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 worship topic, if you will, understand that if the Bible is going to give it to us in a form that says you must do this and this, that is called a prescription. But if it says so-and-so did it like this, that's a description. It's being described. And so you got to understand that some people can, can take one verse from here and one verse from there, and it may be a prescribed verse and maybe a described verse, but when you put them together, you're in trouble. Let me give you an example. Um, there's a verse in the Bible that says Judas went and hung himself. That's a descriptive verse. There's another verse that says, go thou and do likewise. That's a prescribed verse. Yet if you put them together, you're in trouble, right? You can't put them together prescribed and described. Sometimes people get into one verse and, and they will argue that verse to the point it turns into the Friday night fights. People start throwing out verses like they're trump cards in a poker game. And I don't even know if Poker games have trump cards. I, I, I really don't know. But, but what they're doing is they're using descriptive verses, descriptive texts, in, as if they're prescribed, and you can't do it. But now here's the second thing, and the second reason we get into disagreements is when we confuse preference with principle. Preference with principle. Principle preference is something I prefer. A principle is a hard and fast rule. Principle for scripture is when it's a repeated pattern in a described or a prescribed order. Can happen either way. Let me give you an example. The Lord's table, baptism. How about church government? Preference is what I prefer. What I, those three things I just talked about are, are principles that are given in a described manner. But preference is what I prefer. And, and woe to those who get in the way of what I prefer. 
I like to do it this way. Now, you get in the way of that, man. You're meddling. You're messing with my preference. Now, you can always nail somebody on the issue of preference and, and principle just by saying, where's the scripture? Where do you find that in scripture? So, just so you know that I'm an equal opportunity offender, where is is it, where in the Bible do we uh, find that we need to meet on Sunday evenings? And a holy hush fell over the crowd. The Bible says that they met daily for prayer, not nightly. They met daily, but here's the thing. Often when they would meet daily, it would carry on for hours and hours and hours into the night. But the Bible says they met daily. Then it says they went out into the night. <clears throat> so is it right or is it wrong to have a, an evening service? It's our preference. You see what I'm saying? And it's the same thing in the way that we choose to observe the Lord's table. The Lord's supper, it's called. So many people have it as the Lord's breakfast. Have it first thing in the morning. It's, uh, you know, all through Scripture, we see that it indicates that it was done every Sunday, but it's not prescribed, it's describing it. And where on earth in the Scripture do we find the bulletin? It's not there. And, and yet if they're not there on Sunday morning in some churches, some people just come unglued. Listen, preference is the way I am comfortable principle is the way God said it needs to be done. And when I confuse the two, that's when we get into trouble. You see, there's a structure that's outlined for worship, but not a style. There's a, a form that is functional. And you can do this, as I said, with any one of the worship services described in, 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 um, in the scripture, but I want us to do it from First Chronicles chapter 16 this morning. So let me set the stage for this because there's no temple yet. The temple hasn't been built. David is still king, but the Ark of the Covenant is being brought back into Jerusalem and it's going to be put into a tent, into the tabernacle. Now, when that happens, there is a great cause for celebration. Just one chapter earlier, David gathers all the singers together and he says, okay, guys, get ready because we're going to have church. And so when we get to First Chronicles 16, it opens up with verse 1 says, And they brought in the ark of God and placed it inside the tent which David had pitched for it, and they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. Now notice, when you get down to verse 36 at the end of this, this passage, it says this, They blessed the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen and praised the Lord. Somebody said, if you can't say amen, you got to say ouch. And we hear the word being preached, and sometimes we have to say ouch because it's the Holy Spirit directing it to my heart. But as I look at this, it doesn't look a whole lot like the worship services that, that, that we have. I mean, you know, it, it doesn't. But there is a prescription and a principle that... Maybe we can call pillars of worship as we look at this, but but it's it's something that we can build any worship service on, on these pillars. Now, I want to point them out to you in, in this brief time that we have together because this isn't rocket science, folks. This is simply biblical hermeneutics. Now, the first thing I want us to see is that when we gather for worship... We have to have our worship preceded by pure hearts. And that's what David is talking about when he talks about the, the, the peace offerings and the burnt offerings. Remember last week, we looked at these offerings as, as a sacrifice 
for sin. And that's what they were all about. The wave offerings, the grain offerings, the peace offerings, the burnt offerings, all had to do with, with the sin and, and, and the, the coming and dealing with the sin in our hearts. And um, notice in, in verse 1 that, that it says that peace offering happened before the worship. And that's very black and white. That We can't enter into worship just any old way at all. When we enter into worship, if we are truly here to worship, folks, we have to be prepared to worship. We have to have a heart of worship. If we're truly, truly here, we need to be prepared. And that doesn't mean that we're just super organized in every minute, every second of our surface uh, of our service rather has to be counted and 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 in order it means that we are prepared to meet god and 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 ready for god to do anything from the spontaneous to the supernatural word of god speak let it fall down like rain i love that song <coughs> i love even the thought of that word of god speak let it fall down like rain but in order for God to really really get a hold of your heart and touch you you have to be prepared for that to happen you know over the years uh, and this is confession okay over the years I have walked into worship services and I have heard gossip I've walked into worship services I've heard elders talking about their golf game and I gotta be honest that that I've been caught up into that as well. I find myself doing the same kind of thing. And then the music starts. And I'm expected to be entering into worship. But I cannot enter into true worship unprepared. So God, cleanse me and create in me a clean heart. Because if he's going to move, if, if he's going to move in my life, on my heart, I need to have a heart that's prepared for worship a heart prepared for worship. We don't need to be perfect. It's never going to happen. You know that, right? It's never going to happen. We're never going to be perfect. But we need to have a heart that's prepared for worship. The second thing we see here is what we see in verse 2. It says, When David had finished offering the burnt offering and the peace offering, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. You see, it says he blessed the people, and that's the second principle that we see. Our worship is never going to rise above the leaders. You see, if the people are fired up, but the leaders aren't, if the people are hungry for a move of God, but the leaders aren't, if the people long for God to do something, but the leaders aren't, if the people are desperate for a move of God, but the leaders aren't, or, or the worship leader isn't, that church is destined to die on the vine, folks. You see, the pastor is to have his heart right before he can ever expect God to do a move, to move on that service. If he ever expects the people to do the same, he has to have that heart that's right as well because no church is ever going to rise above its leaders. And to those of us who are leaders, to those of us who are fathers, your family is not going to rise above your level spiritually in the same case. And if you don't think that's an important point between the leadership and worship, Please remember this important principle because before Moses could ever stand before the people, he had to stand before a holy, holy, holy God. You see, no church is ever going to rise above its leadership when it comes to worship. And so the singers, the musicians, the worship leaders, all can quench the spirit and so can the pastor. Let me give you principle number three. It's what we find in verse three, where it says, it says that he distributed to every one of Israel, both man and woman, to everyone a loaf of bread, a portion of meat, and a raisin cake. David takes time to feed everyone. Why is that? 
Why? Why is that put in here? It's because true worship, true worship is servant-oriented, not celebrity-oriented. It's servant-oriented. And if you want to kill a service real quick, you bring somebody in that has a, a diva mindset that wants to sing because they think they can do it better than anyone else or they want to do this play or, or whatever it is because they think they can do it better than anyone else. You want to see a worship service go flat, the air go out of the service? Just have that happen. <clears throat> Listen to me. True worship is servant-oriented, not celebrity-oriented. And if you're too big to do the small things, then you're too small to do the big things. David served the people, and this guy was king. Even though he had every right to be served as king, he served the people. He exemplified that servant leadership in worship. What a, what a picture of grace. You know, it can't be about the soloist. It can't be about the celebrity in worship. It has to be about the servant's heart. It has to be about broken hearts that have been laid bare before a holy God. Remember what I said last week, worship is to an audience of one. Let me give you this for free. If you accept their applause, you better be prepared to accept their attacks because anyone with their head above the crowd is going to get shot at. David served the people, and this is just such a beautiful picture of what true leadership in worship is. It's, it's humbling yourselves before... You, yeah, you're, you're before the worship, but, but you're before a holy, holy God. Let me give you the fourth thing here because I'm getting rabbit trailing here. The fourth principle is that it has to be organized by gifts. And beginning in verse 4, it goes through a list of names of guys that we can't pronounce. I'm not going to read the verse. But it, what, he's, what he's telling him is that all of you who have been called need to get to work. You've been called to it, so get to it. Worship is, is that, in the sense that true worship is something that brings us into harmony. It brings us into a spirit of oneness. Because as the body of Christ, each one of us have different gifts. Some of you can sing just so beautifully. Some of you can play musical instruments like the rest of us only wish we could. And some of you can wave your arm in four four time. Some of you can, can train children and teach children to memorize scripture. Some of you can hand out the bulletin and greet and, and make coffee and, and all of that kind of thing. Uh, um, you know, prepare and organize social events or whatever. You can do all of those things that make us happen as a church. And here's what it means, folks. Your gift and not your talent should dictate what it is you do in worship. Let me say it again. Your gift and not your talent should be pointing you to the direction you need to be serving in. David named every one of these people because every one of them had a job. They had a calling. And if you find yourself in our church, folks, or in any church for that matter, if you find that you're tired and worn out, there's a problem. There's a problem. There are two rules that you need to know about God's church. Two rules. And the first one is that if you're willing to work yourself to death, most churches are going to let you. If you volunteer for positions and committees, people are just going to, you know, be more than happy to let you because that's just one more name off their list. And, and pretty soon, when you do that, just for the sake of doing that, you're going to brown out. Not burn out. You're going to brown out. And it's because you're doing what is necessary, not what you are called to. And you find yourself just tired and worn out and bedraggled. But when you do what you're called to do, man, you're energized by that. There's immense joy in doing what you are called to do. 
And now here's the second thing. When you find yourself working with your gifts and not just your talents, you find that you adore to do what others abhor to do. Let me give you the fifth thing. True worship involves the whole man. Now look at verses 8 through 12. David says, and this is a psalm or a song of thanksgiving. He says, oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Sing of all his wonders. Glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Verse 12, remember his wonderful deeds which he has done, his marvels and the judgments made from his mouth. What a, what a picture. But notice in verse 8 it says, give thanks. In verse 8, uh, or uh, verse 9 rather, it says, sing. In verse 9 it says, speak. In verse 10 it says, with all of your heart. In verse 11, with all of your strength. And then in verse 12, it says, remember. And when we look at those, especially the last three, it's talking about your heart, your strength, and your mind. That's a picture of, of, of the fact that true worship involves body, mind, and soul. Think about it, body, mind, and soul. And I know that there are some who may be listening today that are going to say, man, oh man, that doesn't mean dancing. That doesn't mean dancing. Listen to me. I'm a conservative too. And I've had pastors tell me that, you know, a dancing foot cannot be connected to a praying heart. What? Listen, I don't have an ounce of rhythm in me. I don't. But I will break out into a Baptocostal mule spooking fit. When God gets a hold of me, when the Spirit of God just comes over me, I don't mind hanky waving, hallelujah shouting, hand raising worship. I don't mind it at all. It's just that I'm not real good at it. I'm the guy that's beside you that elbows you when I raise my hands. I don't mean to do it. It's just that I'm awkward. I'm awkward, but it doesn't stop me from doing it. A bad singing voice is no excuse for you not to worship. So what if you don't have rhythm? So what? You can still dance in his presence. Listen, I'm not, I'm the kind of person who won't be dancing on the outside, but I'll tell you what, I'm doing the twinkle toe two-step on the inside. Mind, body, and soul is what it's talking about. Your whole being, your whole being is to be involved in our worship. Let me give you principle number six. Here it is, all Worship is contextual. And we see that in verses 19 through verse 22. And what it means is that we have to sing in the language of the people that, and in the setting of the people. Now, if you were to go to Quebec and do a Bill Gaither worship service, the only people who can enter into that are the people who are familiar with Bill Gaither. Now listen, I love Gaither music, but if you want to reach the French, you have to sing in French. You have to sing in the heart language of the people if you want to reach their hearts. Worship is contextual. And that leads me to the next point. Worship is missiological. Missiological. You know, I have a daughter-in-law who has a master's degree in missiology. That's missions. She has a master's degree in nursing. She plays the harp. I mean, you, you know, we're, when we're at their home and, and they, you know, we, and she's playing that harp, man, it's like being in heaven. My son married her, I thought, they're going to end up in the mission field. Oh, Lord, how am I going to ever get to see my grandbabies if they're in Africa? But they didn't. They end up serving in a, in a local church. And in my PowerPoint this morning, I have a picture of my, my, my daughter-in-law in a worship service. And there she is holding my little grandbaby, who's about a year and a half. And they're both raising their hands in worship. It's a beautiful picture. You don't see that little girl's heart, uh, face in the picture because her hand is in front of it. 
but you see her heart. I also have a picture of Alex playing the harp. Such a beautiful, beautiful picture of, of, of worship. And then finally, I have a picture of Ellie, who is now seven years old, praying. Oh, the look on her face as she's calling out to God just speaks to a heart of worship. But I'm way off rabbit trailing now. <clears throat> but worship is missiological in nature. When you look at verses 23 and 24, look at the number of times it says, to the nations, to all people, all the earth. And what he's saying is that worship is missiological. You know, a lost person can't praise God, but they can hear you do it. Worship, folks, is a witness. Do you know that Muslims don't sing? Buddhists don't sing? Jehovah's Witnesses don't sing. We sing, and we sing because we have something to sing about. You know, when I got saved, he put a song in my heart, and I don't care if it's a if it's a hymn, a shape note, or a jug band, man. I don't care what it is. If it's an instrumental, plug it in, turn it up, and let it rip. Because I can worship my God in it. It's missiological. It is truly missiological. And the ones that follow God's will say there's something strange about you people. The ones who follow false gods say there's something strange about you people. Think about it. It works both ways. Which camp do you want to be in? I, I want to be viewed upon as strange because I want people in my faith to be as free as I am in worshiping my God. Let me give you the last thing. True worship is always, always, always theological. True worship is always based on the Word of God. And we see this in verses 27, 28, 29, and 30. You can go ahead and read it on your own. But understand, worship is not about you. It's always, always about Him. It says in those verses, give to God, ascribe to God, give to God, give, give, give. So it doesn't matter if we skip the third verse. It doesn't matter if we, you know, if, if we sing the hymn in a different way that, than I remember it. You see, it's not to you. It's not to me. We are here to give to him, to him. This place is a hospital for sinners. It's not a social club for saints. Now I close with this. It's a story I, I read the other day about a, an evangelist by the name of Manly Beasley. And this guy was a pretty well-known evangelist from bygone days. And he told a story about worship, but he told it from the perspective of his own family. He had four kids and he would call home from being on the road and he was on the road 50 weeks a year. And he would call home. He missed his kids. He missed his wife. And he missed being at home with them. But he noticed something very interesting about those four children. When he would talk to two of them and get them on the phone, they would say, Daddy, Daddy, when are you coming home? We miss you. And he talked to the other two and they would say, Daddy, Daddy, when are you coming home and what are you bringing us? And here's the point he brings out about worship. When you raise your heart, your voice to God, is it, Lord, Lord, I love you, I want to be with you, I want to be in your presence? Or is, Lord, Lord, what are you going to bless me with today? You see, this is hard for me because I'm still learning about it. After almost 45 years, I'm still very much a student about it. But there's going to be a time, folks, when I will come into his presence. I will be before his throne and I will bow and I will worship him in spirit and in truth. So, I don't know if I'm ever going to get it right. I don't know. But until he comes, I'm going to be all elbows. Let me pray. 
Father, again, thank you for your word. Thank for thank you for the privilege that we have to worship you in spirit and in truth. And I pray, Lord, that you would touch our hearts with your word so that our worship would come out of that. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you.